interviewing. And that's really where retention starts, is with interviewing. Because if you don't get the right information from people when you interview them, then you're not gonna have as good a chance that it's the right culture and environment for them and that their skills and experience match what you're looking for mm -hmm. and how it's gonna fit in. So um, that's on the, the YouTube channel if you wanna watch that. Um, the STAR method has been around since the 60s and it was developed by a consulting firm that was looking for a way for all of their managers to be able to be consistent in their interviews. Because there's not a class that you can take in college. They don't teach interviewing. And most companies don't train their managers in interviewing. They just kind of let everybody figure it out on their own. And they tell you what you're not allowed to ask, but they don't tell you which questions to ask and in what format so that you get the answers that you want. And sometimes um, we, we ask leading questions and then they're like, oh, okay, it's kind of like Jeopardy. The answer's in, or the, the question is in the answer. So it, it just goes through those things to help you kind of get a better idea of how to proceed with interviewing. So um, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. No? Okay. So basically, psychology is a big part of the work environment. And you know the reason why people work and the reason why people work in the fields they work in has a lot to do with more now than ever, ever um, what people get from working. It's not so much, I mean, you can, there's all kinds of careers that you can have, and if you don't pick the right one, you're not passionate about it, it's not something that you really enjoy, yes. then you're not gonna work to your full potential. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. So, um, Maslow's hierarchy needs was developed by Abraham Maslow and it's humanistic psychology. So it's not, normally in psychology they're trying to figure out why you do a bad behavior. And in this, it's more about the, the concepts of like free will and self-efficacy and self-actualization versus dysfunction. So humanistic psychology, boom. You using it to help people fulfill their their needs in work because we spend more time at work than in anything else. So if you're not happy at work, then that really has an effect on your life outside work. So we want to make people get the most out of their work so that they're happy and they're fulfilled and they are going beyond maybe your expectations. So, yeah, he wanted to understand human motivation, which is going to affect your retention and also your ability to attract good employees. So if you can't help people reach levels on this triangle, then the chances are they're going to be leaving at some point. Like psychological needs, food, water, warmth, you know, rest, and, you know, just knowing that your lights are gonna be on when you get home, or the water's gonna be on, or that you're gonna have food in the refrigerator. So in the very beginning, when people started working outside the home, that was all they were trying to do, was just survive. And then as the Industrial Revolution, there's been like five different phases, and with each phase, what people need from work changes. It, it, there's more, they expect more from it. So the beginning of the Industrial Revolution started in the 1700s. So before that, people worked on baronial farms or they had a skill, like they were a shoemaker or baker or blacksmith or something like that. And all they really wanted was to survive. You know, they weren't, they didn't have savings accounts. Most people didn't have banks that they worked with. So that was just for the rich people. And they moved from an agrarian society to working in factories. And they worked from, went from making handmade items, like a shoemaker, to making shoes in a factory. 
and they would take jobs no matter what the danger was. They would work on the docks for five cents a day with no, hi. Hi, retention? Yes. Oh, beautiful. Okay. <laughs> They'd work on the docks for five cents a day, and if they got hurt, there, there was no insurance, there was no OSHA, there was nobody looking out for them, and if they couldn't work, then they would get kicked out of the, the hovel that they were living in, sometimes with multiple families, and nobody really looked out for, the, for employees. Yep, and they just, you know, just survival, that's all it was about. And most people didn't have an education. They, they, nobody really went to school unless you were an aristocrat or a, you came from a family where they were a professor or something, and then they usually came from an aristocratic family. So things started changing, and we saw advancements in technology. There was scientific discovery, standardization, a mass manufacturing. The first labor came in 1866 in the United States. Then other things started happening and people started, you know, pretty much standing up for themselves. When this mining explosion happened in 1907, it was in all the papers, people started talking about, you know, these people need to have some protections. And all of these things drive the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and it drives people to start asking for more things. And that's really what drives the change in employment. Um, the, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, because it was almost exclusively women and young girls, that really lit the, the fuse on safety. Because at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, they were afraid that women were gonna stuff fabric into their dresses and steal it. So they would, they didn't pat people down, but they had a, a turnstile that you could only go through one person at a time. And they, they, they checked people quite often to see, you know, I came by an hour ago and you had a lot more fabric than you do now, but the people down the line aren't working on as much stuff. So they were so concerned with theft that they ignored safety. They uh, locked the fire escape so women, the people couldn't get out when the fire happened. There was, there was a, people, women were jumping off the building to get away from the fire. And it, it, it made such a huge splash across the nation in the newspapers. People really started in, insisting on more things. This, and OSHA didn't happen until the 1970s. So in 1914, Henry Ford created a standardized work week. Uh, most people by this time had an elementary school education. Uh, people weren't just trying to survive. Now they wanted to have a better life. You know, they wanted to have a little bit more than just substance to, to get by. Maybe they wanted to have two suits of clothes. <laughs> Now we're talking about physiological needs, esteem needs. You know, it's not just about putting food on the table and being able to, you know, buy medicine if your kids got sick. It was about wanting to have a prestigious job. And in the 1940s, because of World War II, there was such a shortage of employees and the federal government actually passed a law, the Stabilization Act, where companies weren't allowed to just keep giving raises or keep increasing salary because people were going back and forth from one company to another. You know, they might get a dollar more a week at one place and they'd go back and forth and back and forth and the inflation was getting insane. So the federal government stepped in and said, no, you can't offer more money. It's gotta stay within this range. So employers had to think of ways to attract employees. So they uh, created the EEOC in 1965, OSHA 1971, and also in 1942, they started offering health insurance 
to attract employees. And it wasn't until the 60s when it really started to be widespread outside of manufacturing. And today, if you don't have health insurance, it's gonna be almost impossible for you. You might be able to attract people because they need a job and they'll come and work for you for a little while, but then they're gone as soon as they find something else. Uh, now, because of the GI Bill, most people had an education by this time, especially after Vietnam War. And people want to have a better life than their family. They want to go on trips. They want to be able to pay for their kids to go to college. And then we get into the mid 20th century to present day. So most jobs have paid time off. They have health insurance and other benefits and perks. They have uh, a lot of um, like state and federal or even uh, county jobs will have uh, retirement plans outside of a regular 401k so that it's easier for them to attract even if the salary is not as high they're still getting money for their retirement so they're still pretty happy about that so through most of this time like in the recent past unemployment is very low it's three to six percent so it people aren't looking for jobs they're usually pretty stable where they are if they're not getting the up mo upward mobility that they're looking for, they're, they're still kind of happy because they're in a stable job. So they're not actively in the job market, but if they get a phone call from a recruiter and there is something that's lacking and they have a job that they can talk to them about that's offering something, maybe you know where they've been, they haven't done an upgrade in a long time. And we heard that they're not gonna uh, stop supporting version 10 until like oh is it uh, 2030 so you know some people will be like well, I feel kind of stuck we're not really I'm not expanding my skills I'm not solving any new problems we pretty much fixed everything by now and then they get a phone call where they have an opportunity to be on the cloud implementation and learn new skills and maybe be in a larger company where they have more problems to fix so that's when people start thinking about leaving they might be happy until they hear about something else so <clears throat> no. the other thing that's changed is we've gone from a manufacturing and farming economy to a service-based economy so that is another reason why unemployment is stabilized because manufacturing is a lot more sensitive to you know fluctuations and inflation and things like that but services you pretty much need the services that you have doctor accountant uh, mechanic things like that those things they're not going they're not as susceptible to changes in the economy people are working to abstain the lifestyle that they want uh, because there is such stability in the job market People are picking and choosing more. You know, it, it's more about them interviewing you and your company and what do you have to offer them than the other way around. And it probably, you know, years ago when we all started working, it was the opposite. You got out of college, you were take any job just to have a job, an internship that maybe didn't even pay. And now kids have like my nephew graduated and he had a couple of offers from big four consulting firms because he, he was an accountant. He got a CPA and you know, that wasn't the case when I graduated from college. You know, we took whatever we could get. Well, back then it was more getting a, uh, um, not a job. Now it's, you get a job to get money. Before it wasn't like that. So yeah. now a kid is 16 or 15. They can be a YouTuber or they could be right. a TikToker mm -hmm. and make money. Yeah. And so they don't want to go to school. Mm -hmm. They make yeah. easy money. They're making easy money, yeah. So a lot of kids aren't going to school. A lot of um, kids that do go, uh, I have a nephew. He was working for Cummings Diesel as an electrical engineer. And he got a full ride scholarship for his MBA at Georgia Tech. I was like, how did you do that? 
full ride. They, they even gave him a stipend for his rent. Oh, wow. He paid for nothing. Yeah. And now he works at the Home Depot. Oh. And he's a, a financial analyst. And he's making more money than I am. It's, and then I have another nephew. He's, he's 32 and he's C-level. He's a fraud, chief of fraud for a huge uh, restaurant chain. He's making $320,000 a year. Wow, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So when all of us baby boomers, I don't know if all of you all are, I'm a baby boomer, but all of us baby boomers, as we're retiring, the people that we're trying to recruit to work at our companies, they're getting offers like that. So we have to think about this stuff. You know, we may not be able to match that salary, but what else can we offer? You know, if, if somebody likes to fix things, if they're a fixer or what I call a firefighter, and and you don't have fires for them to put out, they're not gonna stay. So you really need to, in the interview process, understand what someone's looking for, not just that they fit what you're looking for, but do you have what they need? And you know, are they going to be able to go to training? Are you going to be able to do these things for them for, in order for them to stay and grow? Now the big thing is work from home. Yep. Work they from want to be hundred percent remote. Yes. You yeah. tell them, oh, we come in two days. They're like, no, no. I don't want to do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm, either they're working from home now, or they're in that situation yeah. where they're working two days a week. So they're like, no, why would I move? It's like lateral moves for the same salary mm -hmm. and why would why would somebody do that when someone wants to do that i i have a lot of questions there's there's something else going on so when they when yeah they, if, they, if it's yeah. it's the same amount of money uh -huh. or it's a little bit less yeah. why would you do that you mean a little bit less to go remote no some people will do that for remote they'll they, they love remote and they'll take a little bit less money for remote but if they're making a lateral move and nothing else is really changing, you know, then I'm wondering why. Is there is the culture and environment toxic where you are? Sure. Is that why you want to leave? You know, what's happening? Most of the time, people don't leave for salary. They leave for the environment or the culture. You know, their manager might be a great person, but they work differently. Like one of the things that I ask managers when I'm taking a job order is what is your management style? You know, if you are somebody who has had a junior staff for most of your career, then you're used to having to hold people's hands and maybe being a little bit of a micromanager. And then I bring somebody in who's senior and they're not going to respond well to that. They're going to be like, I know what I'm doing. Why are they constantly checking on me? Well, because that's the environment that they've had to manage all this time. You might need to give them a little time to get used to having eventually they're going to be like thank god you're here because <laughs> one you know i that takes up like eight less hours in my week because i don't have to hold your hand so it's about understanding your management style really getting into someone's head in the interview and asking them not just about what they want to do skill wise but what's the culture and environment that they work the best in some people like a lot of structure you know, they like being told mm -hmm. what to do next and that they need to ask before they mm -hmm. do things. Other people, especially somebody who's been a consultant in the past, they want to work somewhere where they feel a little more trusted. And if they see something that's broke or they fix something before it's broken, that that's what you want them to do. Some places, they don't want you to do that. They, you got to you know, run it up the flagpole, take it up management kind of thing. And if they're not comfortable with that, then they're probably not gonna stay as long as they would if it was the right environment for them. And succession planning is a huge thing. I get a lot of questions about that. And when I ask managers, they're like, well, no, I don't really have a succession plan for this. So even if it's not something that is, you know, been formalized through HR, if you can at least say, well, we're not a flat organization. We have like four layers of analyst or um, developer or you know we have our teams are small so we have more team leads than you might see at other places that may have you know eight or ten people on a team instead of three or four so if you talk with them about that and they understand 
because it could be that you might be paying more than them, you might have better benefits than them, than the comp that what you're competing against, but if they feel like they're really gonna feel rewarded and they're gonna have a sense of accomplishment in their work, then they might take that because we spend more time at work than anything else. And we all want to have that, you know, sense of fulfillment, you know, that we're contributing, that we have, you know, we don't need to have a gold star every day, but just, you know, oh, I fixed this. And you go home and you tell your family, and they don't know what you're talking about, but you're still happy. <laughs> I need a gold star. You get a gold, you get a gold star, pat on the back. I don't know, Tori, do I give you gold stars enough? Yeah, every yeah. Friday. Every Friday, you get a gold star. How many so. do you have now? like maybe 20. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I find in our environment is mm -hmm. that it's a very unique environment mm -hmm. and if you hire somebody that is experienced they just can't handle it and mm -hmm. you know you try to be up front with them look you're yeah. gonna be frustrated I'm telling you right you're gonna come in here and you're gonna say why why don't you do it this way right. this way is better and mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, learn our way first, and then we can talk about process improvements. Right. But, you know, it's just very hard. And then you hire somebody who's, we, we were just doing succession planning. We brought in somebody who just graduated in December from college, mm -hmm. no experience, accounting degree. He's there for a couple months, and now he's decided that I, I don't like desk jobs. Oh. And so... You know, we invent, invested a tremendous amount of time, mm -hmm. not just myself, but, mm -hmm. you know, because our plan was we'll bring him in here, he'll start doing this, this, and this, right. and we can move him up the accounting one, two, and three mm -hmm. chain, but just... Well, asking things like, you know, what do you do outside of work? You know, and this person is running Ironman competitions and doing that kind of stuff, then, you know, have you worked at a desk before? Yeah. Because, you know... I dropped out of college after the first year because my dad wanted me to be a lawyer and my mom wanted me to be a computer programmer. So I, I took some programming classes and I'm like, this is not for me. Uh, it's just not, you know, I, I could have done it, but I don't think I, I'm a people person. And when you're programming, you're, you're, you gotta sit down and be focused on what you're doing. And I hear something going on over here. <laughs> well, what's going on? What are you guys talking yeah. about over there? So I wasn't focused enough to do that. And for law, I went and I worked in a law office, and that was so boring. I, I would almost fall asleep. I was a receptionist. I, I mean, I almost fall asleep at my desk in the afternoon because nothing was going on. And they charge for everything. The stamp that they send you your invoice on is in the invoice. You've been charged for that stamp. And I was like, I'm not about that either. So I dropped out, I went and worked a bunch of temp jobs all over the place. My parents were scared to death. <laughs> and then I decided, I, I started working at Olsen Staffing in their office. I started out doing their payroll. And then I moved into doing interviewing people. And then before I knew it, I got a phone call from somebody who worked at an IT staffing company. And I ended up there and that's, I love what I do now. I went back to school, I finished my business degree, <coughs> and it's my passion, right? <laughs> she knows. She's been doing it way for your whole I was life. even alive. <laughs> yeah, so it's my daughter, Tori. She's a senior recruiter with me. So, you know, sometimes you have to try different things before you know, and, and just try to get inside people's heads a little bit, and also, um, this isn't part of this, but it's like when you do one-on-one -on -one meetings with people, you, you, you need to have an agenda of what you're going to talk with. Um, it can be, a lot of times it's a casual thing. You're like, hey, how you doing? Is there anything you need? Is there anything I can help you with? And people don't usually just say, oh yeah, I'm really struggling with something. They don't say that. It's dead silence. It's dead silence. <laughs> so you have to ask them questions and say, or, and, and you know kind of keep an eye on them a little bit and say, I see you're struggling a little bit with this and I have one employee she does not like to talk on the phone and she's in sales so that's part of her job is to be talking on the phone so I have to say to her okay um, I'm not seeing 
that you're making the phone calls and that's how you're gonna get jobs. So I have her listening to me mm -hmm. on the phone. And most of the time I'm just leaving messages. Mm -hmm. you know, people just, they're not at their desk, they don't answer. So I said to her, they'll call you back. Mm -hmm. If you're calling them and, and you have something that they need, they'll call you back. Plus we send our emails and stuff so that people get to know who we are. And she started getting comfortable. But if I had just said, you're not making your calls, you need to make your calls, we probably would have continued on. But because I'm like, okay, I'm sensing you're not comfortable, I want you to listen to me so that you see that we're both actually doing the same thing. We're both, it, it, it can be a little boring to leave the same message 30 times a day, but you, you gotta get into people's heads. And that's, you know, pretty much, you know, People are looking for more than just a paycheck. They want to know this is a place that's gonna make them feel like they're contributing, that they have some empowerment to fix things. You know, you have to lay out down the rules so that they're not, you know, changing your whole chart of accounts or something because they know how to do it better. Yeah. You know, those kinds of things. Or they, they decide that they're gonna go through and edit your job codes you know, those kinds of things. But if they see that there's a problem, to you know, come to you, I found this problem, because that's what I say to my people is, if you find a problem, I want you to come to me with a solution. Yeah. But if it's time sensitive, and something's about to blow up, then come to me without it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm empowering you to fix mm -hmm. things, but just tell me what you're gonna do first. said you know some of the people that you're bringing in are don't want to be micromanaged um that type of person um with our company with rpi when i started there was only like 30 people and they originally hired me as a tech person because uh, my degree was in it kind of like you mm -hmm. i could do it if i wanted I to do it's, it. not, my it's not my thing uh, and uh, so cunningham you may know yeah, I know yeah he's like oh i can teach you that i'm like are you sure i've been in education for 10 years and uh, so he was wrong um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. But uh, Keith's like, well, you are a recruiter at the college. Mm -hmm. How would you like to become our recruiter? So we did. But w one of the things that we were experienced at that point, we we're only about 30 people strong, and now we're right around 200. Um, we were always hiring for, hey, figure it out. Mm -hmm. We want the, the brains. Mm -hmm. Hey, if we bring a problem, go do your thing. We're not going to constrain you and say, right. hey, you must do it in this. Right. Uh, and what I'm seeing now is we're starting to. Uh, we actually just did our first group hire. Generally, we were doing ones and twos because that's really all we needed. Now we're doing group hires of 20. So my that's speech at that point is, hey, we don't hire a group of 20. We just do a training class and see who sticks. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what we're doing now. And so we don't hire for the do it our way or the highway. We hire right. you because we know you're smart enough right. to figure things out on your own. And with the kids that are coming out now, um, a lot of them are, but we also have to bring them in as well. Right. So we're trying to yeah. find a happy medium right well, now. Well, they, they think they know. Maybe they they saw yeah. differently. We, have, yeah. we just hired two. We had, one just left for one of the reasons we had said earlier was for money because we brought him in an X amount mm -hmm. and another company mm -hmm. said, hey, here you go. Mm -hmm. And he gets to work from home. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one client, not, not multiple clients. Yeah, so with what we do, we're always juggling clients. <laughs> Something else that I've been trying to get um, companies to understand is they want to bring people in like contract to hire. I'm like, in today's job market, you can't that. do that because nobody's going to leave a full-time job for a contract to hire job. A sure thing for a maybe, that's not going to happen. Um, and with my nephew who just got this, uh, I, when he told me how much the salary was, I was just mm -hmm. 320000 a year. I was like... With the, wow. with the younger generation too, they like to share that info. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. We went, which yeah. when that person yeah. left our office, yeah. and he was in there with all the other kids that we have in our team. Yeah, so like, they really, like, where are you going? Where are you um, going? <laughs> they just graduated and they said, oh, by the way, I'm making X, Y, Z. I was uh -huh. on the phone, hey guys, we want to get down here and settle this. They, they, they now know. <laughs> well, and, and then what they don't know, the part is, is that, you know, we've had people that have been at the tribe for a long time. And they left for money, but then when they got mm -hmm. where they were, they came back. 
the grass yes. wasn't always green. Yeah. yeah. But but yeah. these but these we call them kids because they come hard. To me. Yeah. yeah. And I like, could be my kid. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, like, like I'm feeling a little almost awkward. thirty, so I'm kind of I'm old almost that. thirty. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's like days. Days, you know, carrying in front of right. them, you know, it, mm -hmm. it just, even if they love what they're doing, if, mm -hmm. if somebody says, I'm going to give you X, Y, Z, yeah. and, and, you know, and then you, as the employer, sit there and say, okay, well, I could match that, but are we going to get in a bidding award oh, right. or Over again right. in, in another month? Right, right. It was funny when my dad, back in the 60s, he was in advertising in New York. He worked on Madison Avenue. And one of his friends left and went to another company. And then they asked that guy, is there anybody back at the old place that you want? And they wanted my dad. So they called him up. They offered him, it's crazy now, it was like $45 a week. <laughs> And on that, my mom could buy uh, baby clothes and even Marcus, which is right. <laughs> so it was like, well, it was before I was born. So um, he left and he went over there and he was there for a couple of months. And then the president of the first company called him and offered him. And by the time it was over, he was making $80 a week. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. In the six month period of time, he almost doubled his salary. So this has been going on as long as there have been people working at companies, if you're good at what you do, there's gonna be a bidding war. So you have to find a way to give them something other than money. You know, if if they're offering you a lot more money, what I would say to people was, what's the catch? You know, are you gonna be giving up your work-life balance? Like here, you have work-life balance. There you're on call and their house on fire. <laughs> So you're never gonna have a moment's peace. So you gotta weigh these things, you gotta help people. When I first started in staffing, people would, would quit for 25 cents more an hour. And I talked to them, okay, well, where is this? Well, it's downtown. Well, who pays for your parking? I pay, I'll pay for my parking. Okay, well, how much is parking every day? Well, it's $2 a day. Okay, well, there, there goes your 25 cents. Yeah, you just lost your 25 cents an hour. Because now you're paying for your own parking, and what's your what's the attire? Here we're business casual. What do you? Have? Well, I have to wear a suit and tie. Well, okay, now we have bumped it up again. So there's a lot of things for you have to kind of walk people through things. There's a lot of knee jerk reactions, especially when we're younger. Yeah. You know, we do that, and you know, um, there were people that when I was staffing for RPI a few years ago. Uh, there were there was a guy he took a job at RPI and then he moved to New York and he was like oh because he he got a bump from when he left he was living in North Carolina and when he left I forgot where he was working then when he left them he got like fifteen thousand dollars more at RPI because he's gonna be traveling and everything so you're gonna get that money well he thought well, I'll go live I've always wanted to live in New York and he went to New York no. He should have no. vacationed there first. Yeah, he should have. Well, he did vacation. He yeah. vacationed, but he didn't look at apartments. Yeah. Right. And that was something when I lived here in Florida, so when people shot. would come yeah. from New yeah. York, New York. <laughs> people would come here, buy a house in our neighborhood, and they're like, wow, houses are so cheap. Now I'm going to go look for a job. I'm like, whoa, you didn't, you didn't do a job <laughs> market analysis? And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, and they were a cashier at the A&P making $25 an hour. And I'm like, well, that you're not gonna find that here because it's a non-union state, so the cashiers aren't making $25, and we pump our own gas. Mm -hmm. In New Jersey, you can't. They did that. It, the union uh, pressured the state government to pass a law to make it illegal for people to pump their own gas so that the people that worked pumping gas mm -hmm. could keep their jobs. Well, so, but all, yeah. of, all of this stuff, things that you have to think about, you know, what you can do to keep the people that you have and to attract the people that you want and keep them. And, um, you know, finding people who are willing to refer people that they worked with in the past. People don't refer people that they didn't enjoy working with. Um, one time, <coughs> company where I worked, the president came and he goes, oh, I interviewed so-and-so and you guys used to work together and 
she loves you and blah, 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 blah. And I said, if you hire her, I will quit. Yeah. And he was like, why? She loves you. And I said, because she's drama 24-7. Yeah. She's constant, everything, gossip, gossip, gossip. Yeah. Doesn't get any work done because she's too busy, you know, I call it churning the waters. And he's like, wow, I loved her. I thought yeah, she was some great. Some of those people like that. Yeah. And in the industry that we're in, with N4 and ERPs mm -hmm. and whatnot, it's a very niche Group. Yeah, so, everybody knows everybody pretty and, much. And so when I was doing recruiting, and the president would come across, and he would come back and say, "No, yeah. Pleasant, pleasantly declined." I like this. Well, <laughs> I I appreciate and I respect what you're saying, but can you tell me why? Okay, well, yeah, because sometimes you're like, "No, no, I can't." Okay, well, you don't have to give me details, but you know, yeah. should I just never represent this person? Is it you know they're dead to me? My uh, Kevin O'Leary says on Shark Tank. Could have just been not a fit. Yeah, and not, not a fit. Yeah, yeah. Maybe something. they weren't as We're technical as you needed them to be for this job. That's right. So there's lots of different things. It's just. Well, the sad part is, is when you got a person who can do the job and do it well, but the drama that's going to come with it. With them. Yeah, it's, it's not, not worth it. Yeah. Well, I had somebody refer someone to me, and then later on I found out this person had a problem with alcohol. And um, they were with us for about a month, and we had to let them go because they went out to lunch and got oh. so drunk, oh they God. passed out in the hallway walking back to their office. Crazy. And when I went back to the person who referred them to me, and I'm like, what? why <laughs> did you? Well, I didn't think they had that problem anymore. You know, I, we did touch. Yeah, I, 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 thought, one, no. I thought they got, yeah, I thought they, got through this and I was like so well, at least give me the information so you can make an informed right decision. decision yeah so it's it's about I used to have a boss that told me in staffing we're in the information gathering business that's what we do is gather the information from the managers about what they want what the culture environment is like just yeah. the whole landscape of things and then the same thing with the candidates and it's gotten a lot easier with the information gathering with people not knowing how to secure their Facebook or Twitter yeah, or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So whenever in, in, in RPI we do birthday posts that are just outlandish, uh -huh. I mean, and they'll go and go and go for yeah, a I've long seen. time. Yeah, I've seen. <laughs> uh, uh, and just, uh, we have a, our, a top five USA Today best uh, seller uh, writer, and she's the one that kind of started it. Oh. Uh, Keith's an executive assistant. Mm -hmm. And so now we're getting to, to so big where, hey, if you work, so I take care of all the tech uh -huh. part things, and so it's broken up. But um, it, it gets a little crazy. The information that's out there, you should be able mm -hmm. to find that pretty quickly. Yeah. And then yeah. for referring, like, give a heads up on that. Cause, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and it might not be like they're they're dead to me. It might just be no, they're just not technical enough for this job. Or what we're seeing too with the hard part as I get older, mm -hmm. and the kids come in and they're getting X Y Z, and you're thinking, gosh, I spent my first. These 10, 15 years you know, striving to get to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but to them it's you're not paying enough. I'm because. entitled. That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the hard part. You yeah. just kinda wanna go, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, there's like well one thing is is we were a little bit more humble and meek. Yeah. They're more empowered yeah. than we were. So that may not that's more on us and mm -hmm. how we were raised. I mean, we probably could have got what we were worth, but we never asked. Mm -hmm. You know, well, especially we're as women, we're, we're you know, yeah. uh, we're always. Uh, I negotiate a lot of uh, over the years. I've seen men negotiate more than women do. Men will come back and say, eh, I don't know. You know, they came back five thousand more than I was asking, and I really think I'm worth this. I really think I bring a lot to it. And ladies will go, okay. I, I was working with a guy that I knew from RPI who moved on, and he came back and said, "Hey, I need your recommendation." I said, "Sure, no problem," because I knew what he did at RPI, and I knew what his salary was. And so I just went out and said, "Josh, you need to ask for mm -hmm. this," because he was coming in here. You have my generation; they they'll ask. I'm like, Josh, yeah, they'll don't, ask. Don't cut yourself off here. Yeah. Let them tell you no yeah. here, right. and then negotiate exactly. from there. Right. Exactly. And he wrote me a thank you. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. that was me. I'm like, it's not rocket science. Yeah, it's you not. Sort of start your negotiation down here. If you don't ask, the answer's already yeah. no. You had a question? I do. We're 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 having issues with retention. We're mm -hmm. we're worried about it, right? And so, what we're trying to resolve for is, how do you find out somebody's not happy, mm -hmm. because they don't typically 
Basically. You just go, I'm not happy. Right. Right? Well, the first thing you can do... Engagement. Hmm? Engagement. And engagement, you know, and, exactly. and get more involved with them, but also to do a, a blind survey of all of your employees, and that will not just, it won't be specific about a person, but you'll kind of get the idea, because usually if one person's not happy, they're not the only one, unless they're just a curmudgeon, and they're just never happy. But usually if one person's not happy about something, there are other people, and they may not be talking to each other, but if it's anonymous, then they're more likely to be honest with you about what they're not happy we, about. Our, our company just filled one of those. Life. So we do, yeah, we, 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 our employees in general are happy. We mm -hmm. do annual employee surveys and in general they're I happy. I would do it more often than that. I do it every six months. Okay. Um, a year is a long time. It is. And where we're particularly having issues is with our new hires. We're, they're, they're coming in, mm -hmm. so we can't get them in a survey or anything. And we've kind of started some pilot units you of can. engagement. Um, we. We're going to actually put it, you know, somehow in the eleven um, to kind of track it, and that's as leaders we're doing more rounding, and then we're having those leaders, you know, actually make them, if you will, mm -hmm. get with the employees. Like they have to check a box in the system. Like, did right. you meet with the employee? Were there any issues? So we started some piloting on that, but we still are trying to work around how we find out an individual is there, and three weeks in, something went wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know what. I mean, we always find out after, right? Well, right. you know, that, you know, they were gossiping about me, so I left. I left. So yeah. what I do whenever I place someone, mm -hmm. after their first day, I call them. How was your first day? Did you get your laptop? Did you get the things there? And then after the first week, how's it going? Is this what you were told it was going to be? And then, like, every other week, and I keep in touch with them and then they'll tell me I have a relationship with them because I help them get the job they'll tell me well you know this is what I was told or you know I like to leave my desk and go to lunch every day and everybody else here works through lunch and they don't leave their desk so I feel like I'm putting myself at risk by leaving and I was like well you know what talk with your manager tell them I need to disconnect for 30 minutes and go for a walk outside just to keep my sanity. Or I, I had one person that was upset because there were a lot of people that smoked and they would go out and take breaks every couple hours. There'd be six people outside. And he's like, I leave to go to the bathroom and I feel like everybody's watching me. Like, how many times are you gonna go to the bathroom? <laughs> Nobody actually said that, but they're like, where were you? I was in the bathroom. And then he's like, well, everybody else is outside smoking. They don't ask them. So you just kind of, people, when they first start a job, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of self-doubt, right. uh, especially if they feel like a fish out of water. Let's say they're not as social as the other people in the, the department. Maybe they all go out, they go to trivia every week, and this person doesn't, and they're afraid that I'm always going to be an outsider. I'm never going to fit in. You fit in with so many personalities. Yeah, yeah. There's, that's, there's so many things that you have to think about when you're interviewing people is to ask them those kinds of questions. You know, do you like to socialize with your coworkers? I'm not that really that kind of person. I kind of leave it all at work. You know, I'm, if we have a company thing, I will go, but I'm not, I don't go to my colleagues' birthday parties and I don't know their kid's middle name and you know, how, when they got their dog and all that stuff. That's not because I don't like them. It's just because I like separating things yeah, yeah. from work because I bring my homework with me anyway. And it just kind of, I don't know. I, it's like, I see you, we work yeah. together. Now I'm gonna start thinking about work. I, Jen, when I was doing the recruiting before Stephanie Miller came on board, I would always set the expectation for what we do is mm -hmm. listen. Mm -hmm. They're very sharp individuals, and if they feel like, hey, they're not picking it up or crossing, which, oh, by the way, I know they're not going to, because if you read an import doc, mm -hmm. it's A, B, C, X, Y, P, L, it's not linear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good luck to them. So I always used to set the expectation, hey, give yourself at least a year to really start to feel right. like you understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. At the end of that year, guess what? They're going to change it up on you anyway. Mm -hmm. So just keep progressing a little at a time. Right. And we, we tend to hook them up with a senior tech. 
Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that works depending on the senior tech. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't because they're got to have a match on that if you're doing that. If if one person is, you know, very gregarious, and then you hook them up with somebody that's pretty quiet and you know, they keep to themselves, they're they're not going to feel like they can go to that person. They're going to feel well, I'll be bothering them or whatever. There's so much stuff that you have to think about, especially in this kind of work because they're already dealing with so many different things and they have to deal with customers on the functional side. You're dealing with them, plus you're trying to do your job, plus you're trying to impress your colleagues and, and your boss so that you know, you're gonna get a great raise. Everybody wants to get the best raise that they can get. And, and on average, it's between four and 8%. So, you know, some places it's two to six percent or two to four percent. When, when I worked at the college, every year, every mm -hmm. year, fill this out. I go, is it going to be more than three percent? No. No matter what you do, you could save the president's life <laughs> of the college, and you're still getting three yeah, percent. That's right. You could save a hundred people from a burning building, you're still getting three percent. If you're honest with people about that kind of stuff, but but oh, the other thing that people that some managers do, I don't think any of you do that, but they somebody can be just killing it and everybody you're getting letters or emails from their customers saying you know i've had this problem no one ever fixed it i told todd about it he fixed it that's awesome and then they go into their review and it's like well you know this month you were three times you were late three times this person is killing it they're here till 10 o'clock at night sometimes, and you're gonna ding them on that just so that you don't have to give them a 4% raise. Really? That is so counterproductive. You know, if somebody is a rock star, I know we're not supposed to say that according to the workday commercials, but right. <laughs> if they are, then, you know, they're Eddie Van Halen and respect yeah. that. I'm sorry, I was a little late. So okay. this is kind of more like a, a corporate group or what? I think we have a mixture. Oh, okay. Okay. It sounds more like they're you're talking about corporate jobs, right? Well, it it's corporate jobs, but it's also um, if you're a consultant, if you're a consultancy, it's about that too because okay. people are knocking on their doors almost every day. They're probably getting multiple phone calls a day from you know, competitors and from recruiters like me. LinkedIn messages. LinkedIn messages. <laughs> They're, okay. they're getting, uh, and now Zoom Info has, they give people phone, uh, cell phone numbers out, so th their home phone numbers, if they still have a home phone number. So that it, with this market, this job market, and, and people I've had say to me, well, you know, Google just laid off a bunch of people, or uh, uh, what's not called Facebook anymore, but they Meta. just laid off a bunch of people, Meta. All, the, all these things, so, well, those aren't the people that you're looking for. They're programming in web languages, and you're, you're not. So that's it's not easily, right. yeah, it's not an easily transferable skill. So if, if hospitals, I, they're probably the most stable in any economy because people still get sick. I mean, they may I have to, hospitals. yeah, they may have to do some cutbacks. But chances are they're not going to be laying off hundreds. They don't have hundreds of IT people. 